It's the e-commerce master plan podcast here to help you grow your e-commerce business faster and more efficiently by cutting through the hype to bring you inspiration and guidance from the e-commerce sector and beyond. Here's your host, Chloe Thomas. Hello, Master Plan World. Welcome to our latest podcast. It's a pleasure to have you all out there listening. I'm Chloe Thomas. I'm the creator of the e commerce master plan. I'm an author, speaker, and advisor, and I focus on solving your e commerce marketing problems. If you've got an e commerce problem you'd like my help solving, then head over to ecommercemasterplan.com and click on Work with Chloe. There you will find a link to a form to fill in, and I aim to get back to you within one working day. This episode is sponsored by the awesome email marketing platform Clavio. Clavio accelerates momentum for e-commerce businesses and does it in a fast, reliable, scalable and cost effective way. See why over 7000 innovative e-commerce brands like Brooklinen, Taylor Stitch and Bonobos sell with Clavio. Learn how they're doing it at clavio.com forward slash e-commerce master plan. Right, we're going to dive straight in today, everybody. So I'm going to introduce you to today's special guest. Martin Newman is founder and chairman of Practicology and is one of the world's foremost authorities on customer experience. He's recently distilled his wealth of knowledge into the book, 100 Practical Ways to Improve Customer Experience, Achieve End-to-End Customer Engagement in a Multi-Channel World. So we're going to have plenty to talk about on today's episode. Hello, Martin. Hello, Chloe. How are you? Thanks for having me on. I'm good. Thank you very much for coming and joining us to talk about such an important topic. Um, mm. Before we get into the topic, though, how did you first get involved in e-commerce? Well, that is a funny story. Oh, um, I was <laughs> I was sitting at my desk in Glasgow in Hillington, Hillington Industrial Estate. I was a marketing director for a sports retailer called Sports Connection. This is 1997. Bear in mind, the first product was bought online in 1994, which was a Sting CD. Um, so our Pizza Hut, we tell you, it was, a, it was a mushroom and pepperoni pizza. Anyway, <laughs> 1997, I'm sitting at my desk. I've never even typed a single word. So I used to handwrite everything. I'd never used a computer. And one day I stuck my head out the door to talk to my PA. She was typing a document for me I, that I was looking for. And I said to her, she was on the web at the time, And I said, I've heard about this web thing. Can you show me it? And actually, while you're doing that, maybe give me a bit of a lesson on how to use my computer, how to send an email and everything else. And I just think that a penny dropped for me. And I recognized that from a technology point of view, I was in danger of becoming a bit of a Luddite. And my gut told me that the web was the way the world was going to go and that I had to, you know, throw myself into it. So Literally within a few months of that, I had launched a site in the sports trade. Um, And not long after that, I actually had my first attempt at a services business because I thought, well, everybody's going to want to get online. Therefore, I ought to set up a business that can help businesses do that. And we were doing a bit of hosting and domain registration and moved into web design and eventually into digital marketing. I uh, made a bit of money and then lost it when the dot com when the dot com sort of came and went. I came and went with it. So, you know, it wasn't all a great experience twenty years ago. Um, but it was an experience that definitely set me up for success second time round. It is kind of crazy to think it's only been twenty years since as the marketing director of a retailer, you wouldn't ever turn on a computer. Uh, it is. <laughs> that kind I of was, blows your mind. I was, I was a Luddite and I can touch type now, you know, so I can have a conversation with somebody and not even look at the keyboard and, you know, potentially type a whole a whole document out. So I couldn't do anything without that now. In fact, I don't even write anymore because my writing's so bad, it's pro- quite probably worse than a doctor's. So I can't even read my own writing, so I have to type everything. I would say weirdly, um, and I'm a big fan of education, but strangely, I think the most useful course I took when I was doing my A-levels was the secretarial touch typing course. I think that's probably the bit I've used the most over the years. I'm sure that's stood you in good stead. Oh, yeah, very much so. But um, but let's let's get out of the world of touch typing and let's let's talk about the world of customer experience, because the book you've put together is, wow, it's impressive. It's it, it really is an end-to-end roadmap of how to take the whole business and make it customer focused. We're not just talking about UX here. But um and I you know, I'm in, I'm very impressed you Thank managed you. to pull it all together into mm. such a, a both comprehensive and easy to use format, which I think is the ultimate challenge when it comes to books. Mm-hmm. Um but what inspired you 
after all these years of experience, all these years of, of sent, you know, helping people in other ways, what distilled you to decide to put all this knowledge down into a book? That's a very good question. I, I mean, I wrote the book for a number of different reasons, some of them perso- personal and some of them more business orientated, I guess. Um, so maybe if I touch on the personal ones, first of all, um, I didn't go to university. So unlike you, I went straight into work. I went to work for my father in his retail optical practices many years ago in Glasgow. Um, and I suppose I've always had a little bit of a monkey on my back about that one because um, I'm one of the few people in my family who didn't go down that path. So I've probably always had this desire to prove myself and to some extent academically, which is why that probably led me you know, into thinking maybe with the knowledge that I had, it was a good time to think about writing a book. But my major, my major driver was really about what's happening in the world right now. And I... Mm-hmm. I really am deeply concerned about the future for established businesses, particularly multi-channel businesses in not just the world of retail, but really all consumer sectors, whether that's travel, automotive, uh, you know, food and beverage, restaurants, hotels, etc. Um, they're all being disrupted. And I'm genuinely concerned about what the future holds for these businesses. And I wanted to write something that I felt would provide them with the tools and the assets to have a better idea of how the world's changing and what it means to their business and more importantly, what they can do about it. So I hope to some extent I've written an antidote, if you like, to the disruption that established businesses who, you know, haven't grown up in the world of artificial intelligence, you know, haven't grown up in the world of digital or, you know, and, and, and haven't maybe yet worked out more importantly how to put the customer at the heart of what they do then I hopefully, I hopefully have done a half decent job in, in writing something that can provide a roadmap and a framework towards delivering that. I would describe it as a far more than half decent um, success at having ri- written that. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, you mentioned that, you know, putting the customer at the heart of the business, and it's it's something I often talk to people about a fair amount, but it's something which which it continues to amaze me that it's taken the advent of the internet and, you know, 10, 15 years into the internet and e- e-commerce being a you know a commonplace day-to-day thing that we all do, for us to realise in almost the whole of the retail industry that it's all about the customer, it kind of it kind of seems almost the opposite way around, and it's kind of almost amazing that we didn't realise it was all about the customer all along. Mm. Yeah, I know <clears throat> it, it is. Look, I mean. If you take retail as an example, I mean, you know, we've been retailing for thousands of years, right? Going all the way back to the pyramids and, you know, Mm -hmm. people stalls selling whatever they were selling back in those days. I mean, you know, retail and selling things to consumers is nothing new. But um, I think that what changed with the Internet, I mean, prior to the Internet, I mean, I do quite a lot of keynote presentations and I've always got I've got these slides. I, I, I used to talk about how the world's changed and. You know, back in the 80s and the early 90s, it was all about it was all about location. It was all about the physical store because the consumer had really no other choice. I mean, some obviously some brands had catalogs um, and the odd business had a call center, but really primarily it was about physical retail. And the ch- choice that consumers had was relatively limited because you're essentially restricted to your local high street or maybe a shopping mall out of town somewhere. And of course, the internet changed that. It basically opened up the world essentially and, and, and created all this choice driven by these disruptive brands like, you know, Amazon, like ASOS, like Alibaba, who were able to understand, if you like, how to leverage digital, how to leverage technology, how to leverage the internet to, and, and also to think about other things like logistics, for example, to essentially offer customers a broader choice of products and a more convenient proposition behind how they receive those products. And it, it, it is those early adopters or, you know, the, 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 play, the key players that got into the, se- into the sector really quite early that have essentially created the, the world that we're in now. And they're the ones that have set or reset customer expectations to the point now where I think consumers are very clear about the type of experience that they're looking for, uh, the type of convenience they're looking for, um, and the services and, and the whole, you know, the whole value proposition. And if they don't get it, they're pretty unforgiving. And the issue now is that obviously there's a whole world of competition. It's just a click away. It seems like the, um, it's the big businesses who are changing the customer expectation. 
but yet the, those big businesses are very new. So for the new kids on the block who haven't got big budgets, is it is now the best time to change, you know, to take advantage of understanding the customer compared to the incumbents? Or are you fighting a losing battle because the big companies have set such a high customer expectation that as a startup, it's really hard to achieve it? That's a great question. No, I absolutely think it's the right time. And in fact, I think if you don't do it, you know, now, whether you're an established business that's trying to transform yourself to become more customer centric or whether you're a new business and a startup, you know, there's you've got to do it because if you don't do it somewhere down the line, you won't be there. Either your startup's going to fail and it's not going to last the course, or as we're seeing literally every day on the high street today, you know, many of our retailers and restaurants and, and, and other consumer facing sectors are having to close their physical environments because um, they're just they're not they're not getting enough people over the door. Um, so physical retail is definitely not going away, by the way. I just want to make a point about that. Mm-hmm. But I think the role and the purpose that it serves has to change. But if I were if I were a startup business today, you know, I think that's the perfect opportunity to really think about what it means to be customer centric. What sort of services, what sort of service levels and level of engagement do you need to deliver for customers? Um, and the thing is, it, it, what's interesting is, I mean, you said at the start of this uh, discussion, which I thought was great, you know, that the book is much more than customer experience. And it is much more than customer experience. What's interesting about that, even as a term, is that people tend to think of it in an ethereal sense. It's about the softer elements. It's about mm-hmm. the touch points. You know, putting the customer first actually covers every single part of a business from the products or the services that you create and sell to the technology used to deliver those services to your physical environment, your people, your skills, your structure, your logistics, customer service, data. It touches absolutely every part of the business. And I think that that's one of the fundamental challenges that that most businesses haven't really understood yet, is that in order to do this successfully, you do have to get everyone in the business behind it. And you have to think, you have to understand that it does ultimately impact every part of the organization. Yeah, I think a lot of people think it's just marketing lip service, and then you'll be fine. But if you're, if you're still I don't know, you've still got a call center who don't open with the right hours or you've got team members who aren't properly being rewarded for their efforts. It's just never going to happen, is it? Yeah. Um, Now, you you have come up with something really, really clever in the book, which I would I would be doing our listeners a disservice. Actually, you've come up with a lot of very clever things in the book, but I'll, I'm going to focus in on one in particular, which I think I'd be doing a real disservice to our listeners if I didn't ask you to talk a bit more about. Because those of the listeners like me who have been officially schooled in the world of uh, marketing and all the, the strategies and all the rest of it via the Charles Institute of Marketing will be very, very familiar with the four P's marketing mix. Mm. And In the book, you are strongly suggesting, and I think um, completely rightly, that we should now be thinking about, rather than a marketing mix, a customer mix, and that it should be the six W's. So would you like to tell the listeners about the six W's and and how they can make this work for them? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm very humbled by your comments, and I mean that genuinely, you know, so I'm I'm very gratified and, and, you know, by by how you're finding the book and, and the impact that it's having. So thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the challenge with the, the four Ps, I mean, I, 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 although I didn't go to university, I did actually do a postgraduate diploma in marketing um, course with through Napier University many years ago. But what is, I guess has intrigued me thinking about it for quite a long time, and, and I didn't come up with this overnight, by the way. I spent quite a long time <laughs> trying to think of a different framework that might be more relevant. And I suppose I didn't, maybe when I started thinking about it, I didn't have enough knowledge or experience at that time. And eventually I got to a place where I came up with something. But the the four Ps talks about product, price, place and promotion. Um, And then it it was extended with another three Ps, uh, which includes uh, people, process and physical evidence. The, The issue with the people element of that is it's not talking about customers. It's talking about people in the organization. So here you have this framework that was created back in the 1960s in the US as a framework to help product companies think about how they would sell to consumers. And I do think it was intended in the early stages probably more for FMCG than Mm -hmm. it might have been for retail or other sectors. But it's been adopted, obviously, very broadly as the the the, probably the most important framework in the in the world of marketing. And the issue I have with it is it doesn't talk about the customer and. 
I just find that, I, I mean, it, to be honest with you, it really annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess <clears throat> I guess that's why I sort of thought about or spent time trying to think about a different type of framework because I thought, how can you have something that's set out to help people, whether they're studying at university or whether they're actually, you know, starting up a business or running a marketing department, whatever, whatever level or whatever, you know, element they're trying to um, adopt this framework, but it doesn't talk about customers. And in this day and age, you know, if you don't, again, if you don't put the customer first and you don't then think about how to quite literally center everything you do mm-hmm. around the customer, then why or how can you expect to be successful? So the six W's essentially, um, obviously being a, being a marketer myself to trade, I guess that's how I see myself. You know, I wanted to come up with something that people would remember. Um, for me, the customer mix as a title is more important, but then the six W's, which is the alternative to the four P's. And what I've come up with is uh, it talks about, so the first W is who or whom are you targeting, right? So that's the customer. Um, the next one is why do they want to buy from you? The third W is what do they want to buy? The fourth W is when do they want to buy? And that is, again, something that's much more relevant in this day and age, given that we live in a world of, you know, 24-7 essential where we can buy anything. And some of that obviously is through, you know, digital channels. The next one is where do they want their order fulfilled? And again, that's another example of how the world has changed in the last 20 years, because all of a sudden now, consumers have a choice of where they have their order fulfilled. They don't have to sit at home. You know, they don't have to pick it up in a store. They can if they want, um, but they could be sitting at home. They can have it delivered to their workplace. They can now define what hour of the day they want something delivered. If you're buying from Amazon in London, you can get it delivered in an hour. You know, we've got all this choice of convenience now that didn't exist, you know, 20 years ago. But the last one, aside from the first one, so the first one, again, is who, which is the customer. And then the last one is the most important for me after that, and that is what's next. So in other words, if I buy from you, whether you're a restaurant, a car dealer, a travel company, an airline, a retailer, whatever, if I buy from you, what's in it for me? What do I get next? And I get so frustrated by the lack of focus on customer retention. And I promise you, today, you could probably look at the top thousand retailers in the US, the top thousand retailers in the UK and pretty much every other market and go through those businesses and tell me how many of them even have a role, which is called head of customer retention. They'll all have a head of customer acquisition uh, pretty much. And I guarantee you probably less than 5% have a head of customer retention. And I just find that crazy that we spend all this money acquiring customers, bringing them into the business, going to all that trouble of trying to convince them to buy from us. And then we pay so little focus on bringing them back and giving them reasons to come back. See, guys, I told you it was good, didn't I? Uh, you need you need to go and get the book, if only for the section on the on the customer mix. Now, one of the th- one of the reason I I particularly like this is because I find a lot of the businesses I chat to and work with they get a bit obsessed about a marketing method and forget everything else. You know, I'm sure sure you've come across this as well. We need to do Pinterest. We need mm. to do Facebook ads and they've yeah. forgotten all the important things. So from now on, when, when people come to me and they're like, I need to do Facebook ads, I'm going to go back to them and go, look, think about your six W's, think about your customer mix. Do you need to do Facebook ads or is there a better way to achieve what you're trying, trying to set out to achieve? And I think it's just a really nice model for approaching all our, all our marketing problems, quite frankly. So, so I thank you thank for you. writing it and for creating it. Um, right. The other thing which I which I need to to share with the audience, or I need to ask you actually to share with the audience, is that um, you have a very refreshing perspective on social media, which is something which I know a lot of our listeners listeners struggle with. They know they're pretty certain they should be doing it. They see case studies that retailers are getting great results from it, but they're not really sure why. And I thought the the way in which you've framed up social media in the book is um, is something which which may well help quite a few of them who are struggling with what they should actually be using it for. So could you explain a little bit about that as well, please, Martin? Certainly, Chloe. Um, <clears throat> I suppose, you know, again, being slightly frustrated about, you know, I'm, I'm what we didn't mention at the outset, just so everybody knows, mm-hmm. you know, I had the privilege of running online and multi-channel operations for the likes of Harrods, Pentland Brands, who are a multi-brand owner, brand owner they own Speedo, Berghau, Celeste, Kickers and various brands, uh, Ted Baker, and also Burberry. And I suppose like a lot of things in, in and around this space, what I found challenging was the perception that the business had 
of what social media was and the role that it had to play. And in reality, it, again, it touches almost the whole business, and but, but it's thought of, I think, in a very tactical sense. So I think businesses are still largely thinking about it in terms of promotional activity, when in actual fact, you know, social media, obviously, in this day and age, is one of the first and most obvious touch points for customer service. So, mm-hmm. and that might not even be people who have customers who have bought online, but customers who have interacted with the business. If they've got an issue or they want an answer to something, the chances are there's a high, high propensity that they're going to go into a social media channel to look for a response, whether that's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, uh, whether it's Instagram or whatever it happens to be, you know, they're looking for instant feedback. And um, so, it really should be under, underpinning, I think, customer service and have the appropriate service levels there to, to deal with that. Um, I think in this day and age, I mean, people have talked about the, the commerce opportunity, the social commerce opportunity. And I do think now that you can, and there's very clear evidence, you know, whether that's through Facebook or whatever channel it happens to be, but, you know, that, that it is a driver of sales if you can engage with customers and feed them through to where you want them to then you know, and uh, actually buy something from you. And it could be obviously within that social media environment itself. Um, It plays a massive role with regards to the HR element of the business. So, you know, let's be honest, uh, if you're employing people, uh, whether you're a small business, a startup, or whether you're a large multinational, um, most potential candidates will probably look on not only your website, but social media channels for that first touch point with you as a business to get a sense of who you are, what you stand for, your culture, your values. So I think thinking about, you know, the impact that you can make there from an employer brand perspective. And one of the areas that I think, um, again, particularly retailers don't do as well as I think they should do is is really getting in, getting feedback from customers when it comes to defining what it is customers want to buy. I think we're a little bit too arrogant and we assume, we, we assume that we can create a collection of products and that people will just come and buy them from us. And I think when you've got, for example, social media and you've got engagement with people who are fans of the brand and maybe buy from you, you know, quite regularly throughout the course of the year, why wouldn't you involve them when you were thinking about, you know, new products or services? So I think from a product development point of view or a service development point of view, it's a great opportunity to involve customers in that process and get really great feedback from them, which can help you ensure that what you end up creating is going to be more successful. Um, Obviously, it's a great retention driver. So it's a driver of CRM. It's a driver of engagement. And I've created some examples in the book of brands that do that really well. So one of my favorites is a business called AO.com. used to be called Appliances Online. And they sell fridge freezers, washing machines, and tumble dryers and TVs. Um, And they've got over 1.8 million people liking them on Facebook. They've got 40% engagement on social media channels, 40%. You know, you and I, Chloe, could think of some very well-known household brands that don't have anything Uh like that level of engagement. And these guys are selling for trees or tumble dryers and washing machines. So, in fact, I think I might have used an example of uh, the guys that cut my hair. There's a barber salon called Eagle Barbers in Cockforsters in North London. And they've got well over 200,000 people following them and, and following them literally on a daily basis on Instagram. Um, because, you know, they're posting, you know, the latest haircuts and videos and they've got a tremendous level of engagement. And it's just such a great example of really a very small business, five barbers, five people cutting hair. And yet hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world are tuning in every day to see what these guys are doing on Instagram. So, you know, it can be a fantastic um channel and it can deliver so many benefits to a business. I love the fact that you've used an example of something which is so obviously social media ready, you know, haircuts and fashion and, you know, that sort of things with the barbers. But you've also used an example of what most of us, I think, would describe as quite a boring product category in the world of AO. And, it, yeah. you know, if you can get that much engagement when you're talking about a washing machine, exactly. then th- there's no excuse for the rest of us, quite frankly. Exactly. exactly. And that that's the whole point. You know, I mean, they, they what they've been able to do is really actually create their, their whole customer base or certainly for at least 40 percent of them who are engaging with them on a regular basis have become their advocates and these are the people these consumers have such a love of the brand you know that they're creating so much user-generated content posting it 
on social media, posting it on YouTube, you're getting videos out there that they've become almost like the, an extension of the AO marketing team. I mean, it's really clever how they've really been able to tap into their customer psyche and, and, and vice versa and get them engaging with them in the way, the way that they have. And even more so when you talk about the product category, which arguably isn't one of the, isn't one of the most exciting. Okay, I think it's time we go into the top tips round now. But before we dive in, here's a reminder of our sponsor. Whether it's being able to execute marketing ideas you didn't know were possible, or bringing to life the ideas you didn't have the tools or resources to do before, Clavio makes it possible for you to level up. You can try it for yourself at clavio.com forward slash e-commerce dash master plan. Now, as you all know, I love this section because it gives me and the listeners some really quick ideas for taking our businesses to the next level. So, Martin, your book top tip first. If everyone listening to this podcast agreed to take Friday off and read a book to make their business better, which book would you recommend? And I'm afraid you can't recommend your own. Well, you're joking. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I can't recommend my own book. I've got to recommend another book. Um, well, I personally, I've got quite a lot of energy. I'm not sure if that's coming across my podcast, given that the listeners can't see me. But um, I take my health and fitness quite seriously, and I tend to work out almost on a daily basis. I'm doing quite well for a young man of 52. Um, but I, I read a book called Younger Next Year which I found really interesting. Um, I don't know if that actually ticks the box of what you're asking me because it's not it's not a business book. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, your health is your wealth and everything else is really a bonus. So if you haven't got your, if you haven't got your health, you haven't got anything else. Um, and therefore, I really liked it because it helped me address some issues around my diet and, and also just maybe focus a bit more on my own personal well-being and health. Um, and I, I genuinely benefited from it. And whether or not I'm actually younger than I than I was a year ago or a couple of years ago, I'm not really sure, but I sure feel it. <laughs> I think that definitely counts as a top recommendation because yeah. <laughs> I would agree if you're not if you're not fit and healthy, you can't do what you sh- what you want to do in business. So yeah. you, you can't mm-hmm. neglect either of them. Um, OK, the traffic top tip then. Which marketing method do you either prize above all others or think doesn't get the press it deserves? <laughs> I think the one that doesn't get the press that it deserves, and I think it is the I think it is the next big. I really, my gut is it's the next big marketing thing, and that is proximity marketing. Because, and I, and it's interesting, you know, I've heard for quite a long time now that people talking about, um, you know, mobile. It's too too invasive, you know, marketing to customers on mobile, and yet we live our lives on mobile. And given that, you know, if you ask Google about the majority of searches that they get now. You know, whether somebody's looking for a restaurant, whether they're looking for a bank, you know, whether they're looking for a car dealer or a retail store, you know, more often than not, we append that search with near me because we're task rich, we're time poor. And when you're looking for something, you want to know what is near me, if it's a physical place that you want to go. Um, so I think when you think of it in that context, then I think proximity marketing and targeting customers when they're in the vicinity or maybe even in your environment itself, again, whether it's a restaurant, a store, a car dealership, whatever it happens to be. And that could be with the customer having maybe logged into Wi-Fi or you find other ways of using iBeacons or whatever it is to target those customers or potential customers. But I do think we're going to see an increase, uh, quite a a big increase in that, in both the usage of that as a marketing method and the adoption of it by customers, because we're all looking for, you know, well, we're not necessarily all looking for a bargain, but we're all looking for some added value in some shape or form. And I think if, you know, whoever, whoever the, which, whichever the business is, if they can target us when we're at that moment of intent, when we're ready to make a decision about where we're going to eat or what we're going to buy, then I think that's a great opportunity to help convert us and make sure that we get the business instead of our competitor next door. Another great piece of advice there. So Martin pressures on for the next two. Um, the top, Do my top, best. <laughs> cool. The, it would help, help if I could say them as well, wouldn't it? Okay. The tool top tip, maybe a collaboration tool, a social media plug in a phone app, or just a way of working. Is there a cool little tool you use that makes you and your team more efficient from day to day? Um, I think what I'd rather, t- rather than talking about a tool that we use within the business, I think I've always been a fan of live chat. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've always been a fan of um, <clears throat> providing a face to the business, even in digital channels. And I think the big mistake that 
many retailers make have made in the past and some still make is they they think that because it's a because it's online for example and it's a website that they can strip away all the interaction with human beings when that doesn't that flies in the face of what we want to do as customers we still want the opportunity to engage with someone in actual fact i implemented a live chat when i was at ted baker in 2007 I was one of the first people to do so in the UK and probably the first person to do it in fashion. And I remember having this conversation with the board and them asking me, you know, why, 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 why do we need live chat? You know, we're selling fashion, we're selling suits and dresses. And I said, I know, but sometimes people just want to know, does my bum look big in this? <laughs> and even though, you can't, even though you can't see them, you still benefit from that reassurance for maybe just having someone telling you, you know what, I think you're going to, you're going to really enjoy buying this. So I think that is a tool. And I think that we, the way that's evolved, um, Shu, the footwear retailer who I'm a big fan of and I talk about in the book, they've got video live chat. So when you interact with somebody in their call center through the website, you can actually see that person. It's not just a faceless live chat, somebody typing away. You actually see the person you're engaging with in the call center. So I think that took it on a level. Um, I know that a lot of retailers are now using bots, um, which is maybe a more cost-effective way of, of uh, delivering chat as, a, as an experience or as a service. Um, but the other thing is that some retailers now are leveraging technology that enables them to give um, colleagues in store the opportunity to engage with consumers through live chat when they've got some downtime. So there are tools now, and this has probably been my favorite type of tool, that when some Somebody in the store. So, for example, if it's ten o'clock in the morning, the store's just open, or it's eleven o'clock and the restaurant's just open, and it's waiting for its lunchtime traffic. For example, you know, if somebody happened to be on the website looking for some advice or looking to make a booking or whatever it happened to be, the colleagues in the physical environment now can interact with those customers. And bearing in mind they're at the coalface, they've often got the most up to date insight and knowledge about the products and services that that business is selling. So, it's a great way of taking advantage of the downtime that these people have, that the colleagues have, and also serving customers more effectively. Oh, what a great idea. I didn't know anyone was doing that. So that's mm -hmm. uh, extra interesting. Okay. Uh, the growth top tip then. If you met someone today who's focused on growing their e-commerce business from 100 orders a month to 1,000 orders a month, what would be your number one tip for them? My number one tip would be think about I mean, it really would be around customer centricity, but I think I'd be thinking about how to leverage my customer base. If you go back to AO.com and think about what I was saying about how they've been able to engage with customers. I mean, I've got an acronym that I use in the book, which I borrowed from someone else in the industry um, called return on involvement. So every business tends to think about return on investment. You know, I spend X and I get Y back, but nobody thinks about, well, actually, you know, if I were to spend X, what impact would that have on customer involvement? And the more customers are involved in your business and your brand, the more they'll buy. That leads to an increase in customer lifetime value. It gets us away from only thinking about customer acquisition and focusing on customer retention. So I suppose I, I'm probably going a bit too broad here, but I think if I was to boil it down to one thing, I would say make sure you focus on customer retention. It's not about necessarily going out and selling a hundred new things or a thousand new products. Or you, I think you said you had a hundred, you'd made a hundred sales. How'd you get it to a thousand? You know, getting it to a thousand. Well, I'd much rather focus on how do I get those first hundred customers to come back? And I'm pretty confident that if I can do that and I can deliver the right level of service, not only will they come back and buy from me again and again and again, but they will tell other people about my business. And that will be the most cost effective way to acquire new customers rather than me continually having to invest in all the different performance marketing channels. Not that I'm suggesting that it's not going to be part of the mix, but I think that's a great way to think about it. Yes, and yeah, it's the often overlooked part of growth, isn't it? We get so excited by the new, we forget to look after the existing. Oh, yes. We have after all the shiny new things. And, uh, you know, our customers, the people who have shown us the love, we need to show them the love back and give them reasons to come back. And, you know, there, there are lots of drivers for that. But I think getting the basics right, the right level of convenience, the right service levels, delivering on our promises. If we say we're going to do something, we need to make sure we do it. And if we get it wrong, we need to put it right and we need to do that quickly. And I think if we do all that, you know, and we, we show a level of empathy, and we have the right culture and the, the right outlook, then I think customers will respond really well to that. 
Thank you, Martin. That's another great answer. Uh, okay, Master Plan World, you can find these top tips and links to everything else we've been chatting about in today's episode by heading over to ecommercemasterplan.com forward slash podcast, where you will see a link to this show. Martin, um, we certainly can't let you go without letting the listeners know where they can actually get hold of your book. So would you like to let them know that and, um, and any other ways they can get in contact with you, please? I thought you were never going to ask, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody wants to get in touch, they can email me, martin at practicology.com. Um, by all means, please link in with me if you, you'll find me there, I think is the most... Pro- martin Newman, actually, as I've discovered, is quite a popular name, which I had no, no idea of when I was growing up, but um, I seem to be the most prominent one on LinkedIn, so you can find me on there, martin at practicology.com. Or if you want to buy the book... Uh, obviously, you can get it on Amazon.com, wherever you are in the world, .co.uk if you're in the UK. You can also get it from the publisher, which is www.coganpage.com. Uh, and if you use the code 100, the number 100, CX for customer experience and the number 20, so 100 CX20, you can actually get a 20% discount. So there you go. Um, we'd love you to buy the book and hopefully tell me what you think of it. Excellent, Martin. And now, would you like to just remind people what the name of the book is as well? That's probably a good idea, isn't it? Um, the name of the book is 100 Practical Ways to Improve Customer Experience. I hope you enjoy it. There's at least 100 practical ways in there. There's probably quite a bit more than that. But yeah, I do think it will make a difference to your business, whether you're a startup, whether you're thinking of uh, creating a new business, or whether you're one of the world's most established multi-channel businesses. I think there's something in there for everyone. And, and hopefully written in a very practical way that means you can actually go and do something with it. It's written by a very practical guy who built a business called Practicology. Oh, I like I like it. Okay, <laughs> we'll add uh, links to all of that and that discount code um, and everything else we talked about today in the show notes. Masterplan World, you can find all that at ecommercemasterplan.com forward slash podcast or head to the website and click on the podcast tab. Um, Martin, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's been awesome. Um, enabling you to share a bit more of what's going on with your book with our audience I think they're going to love it and I think um I think they'd be crazy if they didn't immediately go out and buy a copy and, yeah, um, thank you Chloe well I really mean that because I think it's a it's a hugely valuable book um so thank you very much thank you for having me I'm very grateful and thank you to all the listeners and have a good day Trust me, guys, the book is filled with so much great advice for making your business customer centric. Um, it's, you know, we, we picked out just a couple of the key points there, um, but it's well worth a read. So an absolute pleasure to have Martin on the show. Let me know what you think, though. Join in the discussion in our Facebook group, ecommercemasterplan.com forward slash Facebook to find us there. And have a great week. And don't forget to keep optimizing. Thank you for listening to the Ecommerce Master Plan podcast. Find out more at ecommercemasterplan.com.